ASN thanks Otska America Pharmaceutical Inc. for support of this podcast. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Kidney Week podcast. I am Dr. Angie Lobo. I'm one of the second year fellows at University of Minnesota, the host of today's podcast. I'm here with... Hi, everybody. My name is Rad Chowdhury. I'm an onco-nephrologist in the renal division at the Brigham and Women's, uh, also medical oncology at Dana Farber Cancer Institute and Harvard Medical School, and I also sit on the Workforce and Training Committee. Hi, I'm Deepak Shankar Mohan. Uh, I'm a junior faculty at the University of Alabama, Birmingham. Uh, I'm also an intern on the ASN Quality Committee. Today, we join ASN and approximately 12,000 other kidney professionals from across the globe at Kidney Week 2023 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Kidney Week is the world's premier nephrology meeting, providing participants the exciting and challenging opportunity to exchange knowledge, learn the latest scientific and medical advances, and listen to engaging and provocative discussions with leading experts in the field. So Dr. Chowdhury, can you comment on the changing environment for kidney care post COVID nineteen, I'm uh, I'm so happy that the pandemic is essentially on its way out or completely um, not a concern, a health concern as it was before, because it allows me to now see my patients in person, listen to their stories, build that rapport. Especially as a young faculty member, I think that's extremely key. The one thing that I do want to comment on is the fact that during the pandemic, I think many of our limitations of healthcare providers, healthcare uh, structure, were sort of exposed. And I think um, interacting with the folks on the ASN committees, we have such strong grassroots um, uh, objectives and, and buy-in to improve on those limitations as well. How about you? Yeah, I totally, uh, completely agree with uh, Rad on this. Um, during COVID-19, we used to see a lot more uh, televisits, taking care of patients, over the video and audio uh, calls, but now people are uh, coming in to the clinics and it's, uh, it's, a, it's a whole different experience. It gives me a whole different dimension uh, to look at. I'm uh, able to understand patients' complaints in a, in a better way. I'm able to provide better. Um, and also COVID has uh, brought on some good things too. It's, it, it changed the landscape of telemedicine. Uh, it has also changed the landscape of trials. Trials are being fast-tracked and being done in a very uh, uh, expedited way nowadays. Uh, but I'm glad that uh, it's no longer 2020 and things are slowly getting better. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think it changed the way that we practice medicine, the way that we conduct studies. And we have faced so many challenges also with, you know, so many information that's out there that it's widely available to our cha- to our patients. So we we really have to know this information because our patients are coming to us with big questions that we have to be prepared to answer them because they're, they are valid questions and they are valid concerns. So, you know, there's, I think there's a, a practice that we had pre-pandemic and a practice that we have post-pandemic. And, you know, for the better or for the worse, I think there's two sides of everything. And I think we've all grown. It has changed our practice. And I think, to be honest, we've become better physicians post-pandemic. And our practice with telemedicine, it it really opened new boundaries, just, just new frontiers. And we're able to reach more and more places now with telemedicine. So I think it's just a, a different world that we're practicing in. So what are your thoughts on the evolving nature of kidney care with climate change? So as we continue to have all these innovative resources directed towards improving kidney care, uh, we also have to understand the resource limitations and figure out a way to provide these um, uh, innovative strategies to folks that need it the most. Uh, And I'm sure we're going to touch on a couple of those innovative strategies that are coming out. And that will require, once again, the human resiliency that we uh, portrayed during COVID, which is to band our resources and figure out ways to help the people that need it the most. So it reminds me of a talk I attended yesterday by uh, Dr. Kevin uh, Erickson. He was talking about the concept of twice weekly dialysis for some patients. You know, not all patients require three times a week dialysis. If someone is having a good uh, residual renal function, you know, you might even get by with just twice a week dialysis, and that really reduces the amount of water that's being con- consumed. We know during a dialysis session we you know, patients usually use up around 150 liters or so of dialysis, so that 
small things like that you know add up and a lot more innovations are on the way i'm really excited about all the changes that are coming about but us as nephrologists yes you know we do provide excellent care for our patients but we also have to think about other things like climate change and um, be a responsible uh, human being i guess <laughs> Yeah, I thought it was wonderful that this year's um, ASN President's Medal went to Ed Kashi, who is the photographer that has been documenting all the climate change, how it affects workers around the world. Spe specifically, you know, it comes very close to my heart, the ones as a Latin American that, that I am, when he documented in Nicaragua these um, workers that are exposed to just severe climates and they're more propensed for, for kidney failure. And um, being such a low-income country, the access of dialysis care, it's so low that, you know, um, ESKD ultimately leading to death, it's, it's very high in incidence and it's prevalent. So climate change is it's such a big, important topic, specifically in our field, that affects our patients, whether it is through the water use that we have on dialysis or how it affects AKI incidents um, because of the exposure to sun and the the lack of access to free water. So I think climate change should be in our agenda and it should be in our minds always. Now I want to open the discussion to healthcare equity, specifically in education, clinical care, and community engagement. We all come from diverse backgrounds in our training, education, and where we practice. Can you all give a little bit about what you have been exposed, your opinions about this, specifically in education and your clinical work? Yeah, uh, we need to have an inclusive uh, healthcare workforce going forward because I really think it, uh, it improves, give better care to patients and also to improve social determinants of health. I really think that the present and the future generation of uh, nephrologists should get enough exposure and training to understand uh, uh, patients' perspectives uh, and be culturally competent to be able to connect with them in a in a good way so that they can understand patient where patients are coming from and address some problems. We as clinicians, uh, we can come across this on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, people have problems with uh, travel, uh, they have problems with housing, and uh, these are things we do come across, but we haven't really found any good solutions thus far. I'm hoping that in future, uh, incorporating you know th those values and um, achieving better health equity, starting at the institution level, will you know trickle down and help us uh, you know offer better health care to our patients. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think whenever uh, we talk about health care equity, I want to come back to that grassroots idea because one thing that ASN does extremely well is foster through the Kidney Star program, through various different medical student-driven, resident-driven programs. And if you look at the most recent uh, ASN data survey, 10% um, of the applicants identified as African-American, 39% identified as uh, female. Now, that's good, but that's not where we need to be because it's quite disproportionate. And I think we're getting there. We're having people now in leadership roles that are female, uh, uh, you know, the past president, current president, et cetera. And I think to to, to make policy and equitable health care available for all, we need to keep investing to these grassroots folks and bring them up the ladder to the forefront of leadership and allow them to uh, voice, uh, be the voice of change. Yes, you know, Dr. Chattery and I are part of the Workforce Committee, and um, when we see the, the data of different um, parts of, of the nephrology community you know, as a Latina and a woman, you know, I, my representation in the nephrology community is, is very small. So for me, being part of ASN, being part of nephrology, having a voice and being able to showcase is very important for those below me to be able to, to reflect themselves and be a role model for the future generation. So education is very close to my heart, reaching out to um, the STARS program, which is uh, very important, but also, you know, having accessible grants like the, the Campbell Fellowship, the Campbell Award that helps um, provide travel grants to um, ASN and lower education. So having more accessible education to, to undergraduates, to residents, 
to people who are below us, it's extremely important. But however, you know, also the community, the community engagement. So discussing with our patients, having them engaged with us, it's it's very important to to be able to increase health literacy. So having equity, it's it's so many levels of engagement that has to occur. So many so, so many opportunities that we have as as physicians because we're in a a position of privilege that we we are able to educate in. The, the part of residency programs, medical schools, but also to our patients and our community. So being engaged in this for me, is, it's very important. When you, when you mentioned um, you know, fragmented healthcare and equity, interestingly, you know, I still understanding that the ESRD and the reimbursements are so different on a state-by-state level, and that could be very detrimental if you perhaps aren't documented or, or um, don't have uh, you know, an identity here in the United States. So we as, as, as folks that are entering nephrology must continue that journey of educating ourselves on who needs help and how can we get them help through all these mechanisms that you mentioned. Yeah, correct. You know, and that leads to, to the other question, the, to our next question, which is, you know, how can we improve the care of patients that we are managing on dialysis? Because, you know, there's state laws that change state to state for emergency dialysis, for chronic dialysis, for transplant. So how can we improve their care? And that's exactly what you're mentioning, knowing our state laws, going to our legislators, and hoping that we can make a change with our voices. Yeah. Uh, black population and Hispanics are, uh, are really underrepresented in clinical trials too. But if you see ESRD and security patients, you know, blacks uh, are affected four times more uh, than others, and Hispanics are affected two times more, but they're definitely underrepresented in clinical trials. We need to promote more patient education and involve patient advocacy groups and collaborate with them to, to be able to uh, get more involvement from the communities uh, going forward. Hopefully that will you know, improve and give us some data as to find out why a certain thing is happening or, you know, like Rad mentioned, look at some root cause uh, analysis uh, and look for ways to improve it. Yeah, I think this is all great. I think we are, we're seeing this movement towards equity, towards more being more vocal to have a voice, to use our voice in medicine and to, to go to legislators and, and, and try to move that needle to be beneficial towards our patients. So, you know, that, that leads to the next question of, you know, evolving kidney care tools, those new medications, new management tools that we have. Did any of you have any session that you want to mention about of new trials that have come out, new medications, new management tools? Yeah, uh, there's a lot of interesting things happening in the IGA in nephrology world. Parsen 10 uh, got approved uh, by the FDA after the PROTECT trial. It's now indicated for patients who have uh, proteinuria less than one gram, uh, and it was compared uh, with herbisartan, and um, it had better results. Uh, I think it reduced the mean proteinuria by 45% compared to herbisartan, which reduced by around 13% or so. You know, and uh, and Swarsen was also being studied in FSGS, and uh, I think there's also another study uh, called the EPIC study that's going on, and that's looking at uh, several glomerular nephritis in pediatric populations and whether Swarsen could be used in those uh, populations. The second thing I want to talk about is there was a study done looking at GVAS uh, associations in uh, IGN property, and they found I think 16 new uh, loci. And that tells us the, the complex polygenic structure of IgA and how it affects patients. Uh, and it also te- you know, gives us an idea uh, how, about the inheritance of IgA nephropathy. Uh, and, and the researchers found that if patients have a high polygenic score, they tend to develop uh, proteinuria and CKD earlier and also end up uh, requiring dialysis earlier. And just a few days ago, the Alliance study met its primary endpoint, and I think uh, uh, the drug company is going to present the interim data to the FDA. So uh, the Alliance study was looking at atrocentin, which works on a slightly different endothelin uh, receptor pathway than the sparsentin. But it you know looks like the data is promising, and hopefully we'll hear something in the next uh, you know few months. 
yeah a lot of interesting things happening in the IG world yeah I you know I when I started off after medical school I spent uh, uh, about a year and a half in Heather Leach's lab in the University of Toronto and from a pathophysiology standpoint at that IG is just developing in so many different avenues whether you look at the complement story whether you look at the microbiome story um, or the B cell uh, component of this um, now you know the one thing you mentioned uh, about protect you know endothelium ones we've known about since the 1980s or so and we know it causes glomerular sclerosis we know it causes podocyte uh, negative podocyte effects um, so the pathophysiology is there it's just a matter of you know the age of precision medicine right targeting it uh, and, and shutting it off. Um, you know, the one thing that we'll, we'll need to find out from PROTECT is we did reduce the proteinuria, but what's the impact on GFR long term? And I think that still needs to be clarified. We had some great data, endothelial inhibition data from, uh, you know, precision even before uh, PROTECT came out. And uh, the blood pressure lowering effects, having said that, once again, these effects are sometimes modest and you may want to weigh the cost and um, a, cost benefit uh, analysis from that standpoint. Having said that, it is the age of precision medicine and it's very exciting for many of these autoimmune disorders and hypertension. Yeah, I woke up early, very early this morning and I went to the renal denervation session at 6.45 a.m. But you know, even though we've known about this, it's it was a very good refresher um, because we tend to forget about renal denervation specifically because not every center does it. So it was a good refresher and remember that it is an option available for, for some of our patients that could benefit. You know, some of our patients, as we saw in some sessions, that they kept on mentioning the lack of compliance of antihypertensives in patients. So, you know, it's important to have it in our toolkit and just keep it there for, for some patients that would benefit from this. So I thought it was maybe not a, a novel tool, but to keep it close in our toolbox and available. So I thought that was, that was very interesting to hear as a refresher. So I, I'm not a renal denervation expert by any means, but the concept is so phenomenal. And you're right, the data is swayed one way from potentially not, not really very effective to now with some of these multicenter sham studies. You know, now we might have some more efficacy and, and and you mentioned something very interesting, and, and you mentioned toolkit. I think that's that's important because the one thing that we're going to figure out with the plethora of antihypertensive options is how are we going to do this? Is this one, two, three, four, five? Is this one, two, that plus three, four? So the algorithm still needs to be sorted out. And I bring this up because the key here with all these antihypertensives is once again the cost benefit. You know, if, if endothelin-1 inhibitors give you a 5 millimeter mer per mercury decrease in blood pressure and they cost about $15,000 a year um, based on the pulmonary hypertension um, costs, um, then maybe you're better off potentially trying to just do a lactone and pushing um, that sort of, uh, you know, management. So it, more to be learned from that standpoint for sure. Yeah, uh, I, th I think it really helps uh, those patients with resistant hypertension who be really uh, we, we come across a lot, uh, those uh, end-stage kidney disease patients on dialysis. Uh, and I think they, they looked at uh, uh, radiofrequency ablation uh, in both CKD and ESRD patients, and it has shown some uh, good results. And like I had mentioned, these were uh, sham control uh, uh, trials that were done. So uh, I really think uh, th those patients who have resistant uh, hypertension who have increased cardiovascular risk, or for some reason they do not want to take antihypertensives if they're not, you know, able to tolerate. Um, uh, uh, and also, uh, you know, like Rad mentioned, if we have exhausted all the other options, then this is uh, something we have available now. Yeah, and I think another session that really got me excited, but again, I'm very biased because I am a woman's health specialist by training, was the women's health session, that there was a, a full session in women's health and kidney disease. So I do applaud ASN for having a session for women's health. Um, it is extremely important to, to discuss women's health. As we know that women have been understudied, that trials have not included women until um, sex as a biological variable was a, 
a requirement for NIH studies. So I thought it was a, a phenomenal session that we, we learned a lot about managing a pregnancy, um, hypertension disorders. So moving forward, what are you most excited about for the rest of Kidney Week? Yeah, RAD might be an onconephrologist, but uh, I still have a lot to learn. Uh, so there is an onconephrologist primer uh, session tomorrow. Uh, I'm interested in attending that. And also, um, uh, they're going to discuss about the end-stage kidney disease uh, treatment choice um, uh, in more depth, uh, the ETC choi uh, choices by uh, Dr. Uh, Daniel Wiener and uh, Susan Watnick. Uh, I'm interested in hearing their thoughts and uh, think uh, it will be interesting. One thing that's uh, not a talk related, well, it kind of is a talk actually, it's uh, we're having the ASN Kidney Stars Kidney Files tomorrow, uh, which all of our med students, residents, and Campbell Fellows are extremely excited about. Um, and they'll work through a case using the technology that, uh, that we've uh, kind of implemented during this talk. So uh, stop by if you're listening. Um, but that's what I'm excited for. Yeah, I agree. I am very excited about kidney files. Um, I'm also excited about the onconephrology session. Um, as a fellow, for me, is very important. I work in, um, you know, I train in uh, University of Minnesota, which is, you know, it's high up there of, of uh, oncology. So we do encounter a lot of patients who, who have um, the intersection of onconephrology. So for me, for my training specifically, it's very important to be knowledgeable in this area. So I'm very excited about that session, as well as um, there's another one, and I have it here in my, in my schedule, which is um, Novel Mechanisms of salt sensitivity hypertension. So very important to the geographical area that we live in. So to be very knowledgeable in this. So I think these are sessions that pretty much wrap up our time during a, a kidney week. So I'm very excited about these. Yeah, no, and also uh, uh, the acid-based uh, session uh, nephrology quiz by uh, Dr. Uh, Rodby would be interesting to attend. Today, uh, uh, the hyponatremia session, apparently there was no one, no place to sit. Uh, yes, I was there. <laughs> so you were I there. was there, okay. and it was a packed room, and it was very good. It was a great session. So, yeah, it was good. So hopefully future Kidney Weeks have another session of those because it was great. One comment about the hyponatremia, it is so fascinating how we're now in this new era of a paradigm shift maybe potentially on how we manage hyponatremia, but uh, I guess we'll learn more as, as, as we hear from the experts. Okay, so thank you to both of you for joining us during this podcast. Thanks to um, everyone who has been here during Kidney Week. It's been a great time. Enjoy the rest of Kidney Week, and we'll see you next year. Thank you. Thank you for having us. ASN thanks Otska America Pharmaceutical Inc. for support of this podcast.